Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the heavy duty diesel demonstration program review. Looks like we still have some folks filtering in, but we do want to get started on time because we have a full agenda and a great lineup of speakers today. Before I uh, give an overview of what we plan on covering in the next hour and a half, let me first briefly introduce myself. My name is Kevin Leong. I'm a program manager at CalSTAR and will be acting as the MC for today. I have been the program manager on this demonstration since it started back in 2018. And so on behalf of our terrific team of project partners who have been putting in the hard work and making this demonstration possible, we're thankful for the opportunity to share with you some of the exciting developments from this past year. So let me go ahead and walk through the agenda and introduce our speakers. So kicking off today's program will be Bill Van Amberg from CalStart. He will be giving a review of the heavy duty of post piston engine demonstration and help set the stage for why this work is important for getting us to a more sustainable future. Next, Bill Robertson from the California Air Resources Board will present on ultra low NOx regulations and give us more context as to what the challenges and driving forces are from a policy perspective. Then Dr. John Wall, board chairman of the Katie's Power and former chief technical officer of Cummins will present on how the unique properties of the heavy duty post piston engine will allow us to comply with future emission standards, but also do so in an efficient and cost-effective way. And then finally, Fabian Radon, Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at Acades Power will present the latest results from the heavy duty program and share plans for what's to come in the future. We do have some time set aside at the end for folks to ask questions and I encourage you to engage with our speakers by using the Q&A box located in the bottom right corner of your screen. And we will do our best to address your questions either in real time during the program or when we go into the Q&A segment at the end. So with that said, let me go ahead and kick things off. And for anyone who's just joining us now, thank you and welcome to the Heavy Duty Diesel Program Review. I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the day, my friend and colleague, Bill Van Amberg. Bill is the executive vice president at CalSTAR and is considered an industry expert when it comes to advanced transportation technologies. Bill has influenced many critical programs in the clean transportation industry, most notably playing an important role in developing the beachhead strategy for market transformation of medium and heavy duty vehicles for zero emission and low NOx in partnership with the California Air Resources Board. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Bill to set the stage for today's program share with us why this work is important when it comes to creating a more sustainable future. Thank you, Bill. Great, and thank you, Kevin, uh, for this. And I'm really excited. We've got a tremendous team of partners with us today to walk through what we think are some pretty world-class results that are coming out of uh, this demonstration program to bring forward what we think is the cleanest combustion, lowest carbon combustion engine in the world. Uh, and that's important because we really need to aim towards, uh, at the end of the day, we, our, our goal is zero emissions and zero carbon, but it's a long pathway there. And we need all the tools in the tool chest to get there. And that's why we're so excited about this heavy duty opposed piston engine project. Let's go to the next slide. And just for brief background for folks who maybe aren't as aware of CalStart, we are a clean transportation technologies nonprofit, a, a consortium, if you will, of more than 280 companies across not just North America, but now increasingly internationally. All these companies from automotive and truck and bus manufacturers to tier one suppliers and this new emerging supply chain are focused on bringing the cleanest possible technologies to the market for advanced clean transportation to address our climate and air quality goals. Next slide. And I think that's worth really keeping in mind because we all are pretty aware uh, who are at least on, on this uh, webinar today, that climate is such a, a pressing issue. And it's becoming increasingly clear that we may need to move ever faster than even we thought just a few years ago. And in fact, we really need to be getting, a, as California's goals have set and the world goals are set, at a 40% reduction from 1990 levels. California has been on track for some of that, but getting to that next tier by 2030, the 40% reduction, and then getting now to zero or 100% reduction by 2045, that's, that's a heavy lift. But that's the climate piece. In parallel with that, we have another issue. And if we go to the next slide, 
it's something we all experience, not just in urban regions, but really even in, in kind of our growing cities and towns around the world. And that's an air quality emergency. And the World Health Organization really did a study, recently did a study on this and found that 93% of the world's children grow up in polluted air. That's really an unacceptable condition in this day and age. And yet that is the condition we face with more and more people migrating into cities, the urban areas are where the jobs are. We're seeing this tremendous growth. It's also where our transportation hubs are. And medium and heavy duty vehicles are really the key cause of a lot of that pollution in our urban regions. Let's go to the next slide and just quickly walk through that. Many of you are aware of this, but on a global basis, the number of vehicles that we see that are medium and heavy duty are relatively small compared to the light duty and other vehicles on the road. Well, they have a huge impact when it comes to uh, the dangerous pollutants, the criteria pollutants that, that do cause health problems, both in particulate matter, but particularly in NOx. 71% of the NOx uh, globally do come from medium and heavy duty diesel vehicles. And if you go to the next slide, you can see when we really drill down into the state of California, which is where this program is taking place, uh, that NOx is 77% caused by medium and heavy duty vehicles. So we need to continue to target these sectors, both the on-road and the off-road uh, equipment sector to be able to drive these emissions down. That's why there's been so much push for zero emission technology everywhere it can be done, but we need to continue to push the combustion engines to be as clean as they possibly can. Next slide. The other condition that I think we're all very aware of is that people who live in regions, particularly where these transportation centers are, distribution centers, work sites, uh, they have the most polluted air that they face, are often uh, really disadvantaged communities in California, but they're communities where people of color uh, generally have lived. And they are tired, and there has been a huge national push. It came certainly last year with what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of the attention that got paid to equity issues, this is something that we no longer can allow to happen. And communities are rising up across this nation and certainly around the world to say, we've had enough. We want our air to be cleaner. And there is an additional push that is forcing regulators and manufacturers to really realize we've got to move faster to get cleaner air into these communities. Next slide. That's why in California, you've seen very aggressive action. We're starting to see that in other parts of the world, uh, in Europe in particular, but also in other states in the US. And now increasingly, the US government is really looking at this. But in California, we've got many sets of regulations that have been set up because of these dual path conditions of carbon and air quality. Uh, there's the innovative clean transit rule aimed at trucks, at buses, the advanced clean truck rule, which is aimed at trucks which is really driving a requirement for a certain percentage of vehicles to be zero emissions starting in 2024 and then ramping up. There is the low NOx combustion or omnibus rule, the regulation was called. And that was really driving everything that could not be uh, zero emissions needed to get to the lowest possible combustion points. Uh, we don't have to get into the technical terms now. Bill Robertson will walk through a little bit more of that but it's a very low condition, 90% under what the EPA stands. Getting an engine that clean and having it stay efficient is really the secret sauce that this program has been focused on. But you can see combustion bans, uh, as well as some supporting uh, mechanisms, such as incentives, are what the state is focused on. Next slide, please. So we talked about uh, briefly, Kevin, when he introduced me, the beachhead strategy, which is a, a fancy term for technologies start in certain core applications and then particularly in the zero emission space are able to, to start to move into additional adjacent markets as volumes go up in components, as prices start to come down and they're able to really affect the business case in a broader and broader volume of vehicles and application types. So this is how we look at things in terms of this rapid transition, but still a transition that is going on into medium and heavy duty vehicles for electrification. And it's exciting to see what's happening, but we're only starting now to touch some of the heavier classes of vehicles with some of the first vehicle products coming out. Next slide.
At the same time, we need to move forward very rapidly uh, to make sure that our combustion pathways are clean. So as we've looked at this, the cleanest vehicles in the past in the combustion space have been those that have been gaseous fueled, or if you will, natural gas, propane, and the like. They have been able to get down to this 90% reduction below 2010 uh, EPA standards mark. Uh, but CARB has set a goal uh, to get diesel there by two steps by 2024 and then finally by 2027, so that diesel vehicles will all actually be meeting that same standard. One of the challenges though, is how do we make sure those engines stay efficient and meet the carbon reduction goals we also have to meet on this timeline? So they can't keep start burning more fuel. And one of the challenges has been that the more you ramp down NOx traditionally, the more fuel you use and therefore the more carbon. It's been this trade-off. This is something we've tried to uh, short circuit or at least move to a new bar with the opposed piston engine. Next slide, please. So I think one of the things that is a takeaway for us and that we would share today is why we've been so supportive at CalStart of this program is that we really believe we have to make both these reduction pathways go forward hand in hand and together. We can't do trade-offs anymore. We can't do let's reduce NOx, but let's slide on carbon or let's reduce carbon and slide on NOx. We need both. That's why there's been such a, a big focus on getting electrification everywhere it possibly can. And there is a really strong transition there. But we also know there will be vehicles on the road for decades to come and new vehicles bought for decades to come that will use combustion engines. There's going to be applications and duty cycles that are gonna be very difficult in the near term for electrification, electrification to cover. In those cases, we, meet, we need combustion engines to be the lowest emitting and lowest carbon we possibly can get. And that's gotta be a combination of efficiency and the fuel type that's used. And again, that's the context for why this is so uh, exciting to us that this opposed piston engine, as you'll find out during the course of this presentation today, uh, is allowing us to aim and reach those target points. Next slide. So uh, with that as context, uh, this is the, the team that uh, we pulled together, together with Acades and the California Air Resources Board to tackle this issue. Acades, uh, which is developing in the state of California an advanced opposed piston engine, uh, then was able to bring in best of class suppliers. And you can see some of them there, Eaton, Honeywell, Delphi, Tenneco, you can read the list. We'll walk through more of them later today to bring in best of class technologies to add to the after treatment system to combine with the inherently low emission output of this engine and its efficiency. We had uh, two of the major air districts in the state say this is important enough that we wanna contribute funds to it. In fact, three air districts uh, took part, South Coast AQMD, the San Joaquin Valley APCD and the Sacramento Air Quality Management District. We also have a, a couple of major fleets who want to test this in their vehicle platforms, those in particular that are gonna be harder to electrify. And of course, a major truck maker, Peterbilt, who is integrating this demonstration stage engine into their truck so we can actually see what it's gonna to take to put it out on the road and ruggedize it for actual use. So that's the framework for this program. We're very excited about it. It is showing tremendous results, better than we at first thought. And so that's what we wanna walk you through today and give you a status report on this incredibly exciting technology. Kevin, back to you. Great, thank you, Bill. And, and thanks for shedding light on why it's important to tackle climate and air quality together and to do so as quickly as possible. Um, so, so next on our agenda is Bill Robertson from the California Air Resources Board. He is a vehicle program specialist within the Mobile Source Control Division at CARB, is well equipped to talk about the challenges of meeting these aggressive emissions targets in order to combat the climate emergency that Bill Van Amberg had touched on. So Bill is going to share how this is being approached from a policy perspective, and will speak on some of the latest regulatory actions California has taken. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Thank you. And I want to you know, thank Bill Van Amberg for that, that great introduction. Um, as a, talk about some of the some of our perspective on on why we're interested uh, in a in a combustion project in the middle of a of our large zero emission push. Uh, next slide please. So the heavy duty trucking uh, 
is, is quite a complex, uh, diverse uh, set of activities and applications. Um, and we, we, as you're seeing in the pie charts in, in Bill's presentation on uh, you know, how much of the, the NOx is coming from heavy duty trucks, even though they're you know, three, 4% of the, of the numeric population of the on-road fleet, um, we really have to uh, pay attention to this, this sector. And you know, California, the California Resources Board um, kind of has three scales we work on. There's the, the, our part of the global climate change and identifying technologies that are applicable there. Um, there's the, the, the regional issues like ozone and PM that we've worked on uh, for quite a while. And we're also looking very granularly at the, at the community scale, um, making sure that, uh, that all of our, our residents are, are getting benefit from, from these programs and, and that are their particular ones getting left behind. Um, but so as we, as we try to address, make sure that we're cleaning up uh, heavy duty uh, transportation across all of these issues, um, there, there's some pretty significant challenges. Uh, we, we know that trucks change what they do as they change ownership. Uh, going from, you know, kind of high mileage, high speed applications down to slower things as they age and people keep them closer to home and trust them, a, a given truck less or whatnot, whatever the reasons are for, for older trucks not driving as many miles uh, that tend to go slower. Um, but we also know from, from data logging that, that uh, individual trucks, even in their first application, experience quite a range of duty cycles. And, and today's engines, as they slow down, have not been calibrated to keep their SCR systems warm. And we know there's some NOx issues that, that are going on there. So we, we need solutions that are, that are versatile in how these vehicles get used. Um, and then there's the issues of, you know, we, the, the solutions need to uh, meet the, the demands of of the task at hand and whether that's how much energy you've got to be able to carry on a vehicle for a shift um, and, and how you get that energy onto the vehicle. And so for different technologies, um, you know, those, those challenges manifest differently. Um, and so looking for uh, solutions that can, can give us near-term benefits as well as, you know, looking out further, have us looking at, at kind of an all of the above uh, approach on this. Um, and uh, the, the 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 little inset graphs there, you know, the the, the chart is is the uh, sales percentages for our advanced clean truck regulation over over model years. Um, and even though you know that we're we're pushing that as hard as we think we can, um, there's still quite a bit of of you know internal combustion trucks being sold for for quite a few number of years there, and and. Then there are the vehicles that are that are still in the fleet as well. So we we know that that uh, engines and combustion are a topic we have to take very seriously, um, and we're we're excited about uh, new technology that can can help clean that up. And the the, the map there shows uh, ozone contribution from heavy duty trucks nationwide. Uh, this came from a EPA study where they looked at different mobile source sectors and what was the effect on ozone and PM from those. And the the largest effect they, they found from mobile source, the, the, the best target for doing something to, to get a benefit uh, is the on-road heavy duty. Um, so it, uh, we're, we're excited that these technologies look like they have broad applicability well beyond California. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what is in this uh, Lonox omnibus uh, reg that we that our board just adopted last fall. Um, so this is the piece that was looking at the internal combustion, uh, you know, regulations for diesel engines and, and other heavy duty engines uh, and really saying, okay, well, let's, let's uh, take all we know from our demonstration projects and, and, and put together a regulation that, that asks heavy duty truck engines to be as clean as we think they can be. And, and that's where this, this uh, 
two-step uh, set of standards in 2024 and then uh, ratcheting down in 2027 to the 0.02 gram per brake horsepower hour NOx level comes in. Um, it also uh, contains uh, a number of elements that get at wanting to make sure that the, these systems that, that have been working well in certain situations, um, that, that the work gets put in to make sure that they operate across the uh, duty cycle envelope of these, these vehicles. And, and so that, that's where the low load cycle and, and some low load requirements for in-use uh, performance uh, testing come in to, to make sure that um, whether a vehicle is, is being run hard or it's, it's uh, in you know, trying to get from the freeway to the distribution facility or to the delivery point uh, that, it, that it still is uh, providing uh, a good emissions control. So there's a, you know, the lower standard, um, this, this duty cycle uh, uh, resilience, uh, and then, then there's the making sure that the, the uh, performance is, is achieved through the life of the vehicle and that the, the emission system is well supported uh, uh, during, that, uh, during the life of the vehicle. And so to support that, we, we have uh, requirements for a, a much longer um, design life and, and durability demonstration for, for the engines and uh, as well as requiring that the warranty cover a, a large fraction of the vehicle's life to, to make sure that the design decisions um, uh, are, are done thoughtfully, uh, that the folks with design control are, are thinking about this, this really long-term operational part of the, the vehicle. So this is a, a pretty big package of, of uh, requirements and, and, and standards, um, but it's, it's building on uh, a lot of work we've been doing on, on heavy duty NOx going back a uh, couple of decades, putting in the standards that brought us SCR and DPF that we did with US EPA. And then we followed up that with um, trying to, to accelerate the turnover of our existing fleet to the SCR technology. And that's this truck and bus rule that, that uh, matures in 2023, when pretty much every truck in California has to have a, a a factory SCR system on it, uh, but but that didn't get us far enough, and so uh, we we have this this omnibus set of standards to to uh, try and and really get the potential out of these uh, SCR technologies. But to to get that benefit, of course, it has to you know work across the 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 range of applications and situations a truck sees. It has to do that for a very long time. But there's also this operational efficiency and, and capital costs that together have to be uh, at a point that allows for uh, broad rollout and uh, you know, a, a significant uptake so that the, the actual emissions inventory and vehicle stock uh, uh, is, is changing and, and, and generating these benefits. Uh, so that's, that's what's exciting about the technology we're going to hear about today um, as, a, as a pathway to to uh, access uh, a, a lot of the, you know, these very, uh, in, with a lot of potential. So I also wanted to mention off the end of this, it wasn't a piece of the omnibus, but um, we are working uh, at looking at how all of these things we assessed for the on-road can be transferred to off-road. And so we'll be developing a set of, uh, a next tier of off-road emission standards. and be looking at how, uh, engine technology and zero emissions and, and partial electrification and all of those things can work together to make a, make a, 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 a good uh, a package there. Um, but it's, it's clear that the same kind of challenges that we see in the on-road of, of uh, energy packaging on the vehicle and, and infrastructure um, and semi-nomadic equipment and that kind of thing um, also shows up in the off-road. So we're excited about applications for this uh, project today uh, applying to off-road as well. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, we're, we're working hard on this. Uh, California's taken a leadership position. Uh, our governor has been out front uh, signing us on to, you know, his uh, zero emission MOU. 
that has received a lot of press for being a, a uh, internal combustion car ban, but it has in it also timelines for heavy duty trucks and for off-road and that, that are pretty aggressive. And then it, it, but it also has this, you know, where feasible caveat. And so there's a lot of interesting discussion to be had of, you know, what is, what can each technology bring to the table? And, you know, where does, where does that break point uh, uh, happen? Um, the, he also signed us on to the 15 state uh, medium and heavy duty vehicle, uh, zero emission vehicle MOU. And so this is uh, a number of states in the District of Columbia uh, looking to accelerate zero emission uh, trucks and buses. But it also, um, you know, calls out this, this transition issue and that, you know, we can't be leaving combustion behind while we work on these very important uh, issues and, and technology advancement. So, you know, the, we, are, we are very committed to doing zero emission everywhere we can, but the, the internal combustion is very important to, uh, in, in this uh, transitional period that, that we're going to see between now and, and when zero emission uh, can take over most of, of what's done in our society. Um, so we, last year we, adopted the omnibus and the advanced clean trucks measure that, that uh, Bill Van Anberg mentioned. Um, New York and New Jersey are already out publicly workshopping uh, their adopt process for adopting these programs. Um, a number of other states are also uh, working through their evaluation process and for, for their pathway on this. Um, and, and we think this, the, both the, um, interest from the from the states and 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 folks that stand to benefit from these uh, emissions reductions as well as the the body of technology that's that's uh, uh, coming out for uh, working on these solutions is really building strong support for a, for a meaningful uh, heavy duty policy out of US EPA and we we look forward to uh, them making some good progress on that. So that, that concludes my talk. I think I got contact information on the, my last slide. Um, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bill. And it's, it's great to see the regulatory action uh, that California and other states are taking to really drive cleaner technologies and, and looking at you know, all, this, all of the above approach that you mentioned on how to get there. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. John Wall, board chairman of the Katie's Power. John has more than 40 years of industry experience in internal combustion engine technology, fuels and emissions, and in global engineering development. Most recently, John served as chief technical officer of Cummins, the world's largest independent manufacturer of diesel engines. And prior to Cummins, John led diesel and aviation fuels research for Chevron, where his team was the first to uh, discover the important contribution of fuel sulfur to diesel particulate emissions. So John's going to take us through the evolution of diesel technology and how the unique architecture of the opposed piston engine can play a critical role when it comes to meeting these regulations and driving sustainable transportation. Thank you for, thank you, uh, for joining us, John. Thanks, Kevin. Yes, I'd like to uh, just take a little, a brief walk down memory lane uh, and then look ahead to the future and see how the work that we're doing at Acadie spits into this context. So uh, next slide, Alex. Thanks. Um, so if you wanna know what Tom Cat and I worked on together for about three decades, it's pretty much all on this chart. Um, and I think one of the important points that I'd like to make here is the importance of the partnership between the regulators and the industry. The regulator, uh, regulators have a mandate in the Clean Air Act to be technology forcing. Uh, those very words in the Clean Air Act, the industry role, my words, is as a delivery partner. Uh, you can write all the regulations you want, but someone's got to develop the technology, integrate it into a product, sell it to a customer, and the customer buys it and uses it, and that's how you get low emission technology into the marketplace. So we're looking for the full package here that has not only the low emissions, low criteria pollutants, uh, low CO2, but also benefits that will uh, would that will allow the customers to draw it into use. Uh, the chart on the left shows the progress that we've made on criteria pollutants over this period of time. In fact, even backing up to the uh, 1986 where NOx was 10.6 grams, believe it or not, that first step to six felt pretty tough back then. 
Um, and we've made uh, over that period of time a 98% reduction in NOx, 99% reduction in particulates. And I've shown the progress that we made in introducing the various technologies on the right as a series of S curves where you have early adopters that develop the technology, then you have the more broader adoption of the technology in the marketplace. And then it's superseded or augmented by uh, subsequent technologies. And these are not just technical steps. These are important business decisions that have huge ramifications for the companies. For example, Detroit Diesel introduced electronic fuel systems across their product line back in the early 1990s ahead of the rest of the industry. And they picked up 10 to 15% market share. When we moved to cooled exhaust gas recirculation in uh, 2002 uh, against the 2004 standard, uh, Caterpillar elected not to move to cooled EGR. And by 2010, they were out of the on highway heavy duty engine business. Uh, similarly, uh, Navistar elected not to move to selective catalytic reduction in 2010. And it had a huge negative impact on their business. So this is not just a technology progression, it's a business progression and the decisions that businesses make as we go along looking at how to comply with the regulations and deliver value to the customer are extremely important. They have been over time and they certainly are uh, looking forward. Uh, next slide, Ox. So starting in 2014, uh, uh, back up one, I think we skipped one. There we go. Uh, starting in 2014, the attention turned uh, from NOx and PM to CO2. So with the phase one and phase two greenhouse gas rules, I've shown this as sort of a longer drawn out S-curve. There were certainly some technology advances that were done to improve the efficiency of the engine and improve the fuel economy uh, at the vehicle level as well as at the engine level, but honestly not as significant as the steps in the criteria pollutant technology uh, ladder that we, we've seen on the left. Now we can go to the next slide. Uh, Bill has taken you through what's happening in 2027. And of course, that is our next big step. Now we're looking at an additional 90% reduction in NOx, even from the 2010 standard. And there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, it's the NOx plus the CO2, but it's also focusing on in-use compliance, being able to uh, activate SCR systems or whatever NOx control system uh, we have in the exhaust in lightly loaded in urban applications in areas where, um, where the current on highway truck uh, after treatment systems aren't as effective as we need them to be. So uh, CARB has added low load cycle, idle NOx limits, and also extended the useful life because these trucks last for a long time uh, and extending the useful life and warranty to 800,000 miles. So that is the future challenge for diesel technology to be able to comply in the 2027 timeframe with these much more uh, stringent NOx and, uh, and continuing uh, CO2 regulations. Next slide, Ox. So that leads us to why we're here today. This is what we think is a future opportunity for diesel technology. The Acades of post-piston two-stroke engine will enable much more effective uh, emissions control in lightly loaded applications as well as better efficiency. So lower cost of durable compliance with the future emission standards and superior fuel economy for the customer, which is what one of the things it takes to get this into, uh, gets this into use. So it has real uh, impact on the environment. It has uh, inherently low CO2. Uh, it has inherently efficient exhaust thermal management. And for those of you uh, who like me have, uh, lived in the four stroke world for a long time, this is a very different machine. It's a flow device that allows you to actually control the airflow through the engine in a way that, uh, that we can increase the exhaust temperature under lightly loaded uh, conditions without affecting efficiency. And at the same time at high load, we can limit uh, the peak temperatures so that we can improve the durability of the after treatment systems. So that inherently efficient exhaust thermal management is a huge part of this that gives inherently lower complexity and cost at ultra low and low CO2. And it is the and that is the big promise uh, for this engine, the ultra low NOx and low CO2. And the only way you get low CO2 is you get better fuel economy. So that's what we're here to really uh, talk about today. We certainly appreciate the support 
that we've gotten from CARB, from the AQMDs, from CalSTART, from DOE, to be able to develop and demonstrate the technology at the level that you're going to be hearing about today. We are currently putting together uh, a partnership of companies to help move into um, uh, commercialization, move toward commercialization with the technology. And so uh, I think that's another part of this regulatory partnership with industry, having the regulations in place, having the technology, the best available control technology that can be identified, and then to be able to move that to commercialization. Uh, so with that, I think uh, we'll move on into the details with Fabian. We certainly appreciate you joining us here today. And uh, you know, as we go through, go ahead, if you have any questions or uh, any interest in participating in uh, the program, then you can contact myself or Fabian uh, afterwards and, and we'll be glad to hook you up. So thanks very much, Kevin and Fabian, take it away. Great, thank you, John. And yeah, we appreciate the, the wealth of industry experience and knowledge that you, you bring to the conversation today. So um, as John was introducing our next speaker, our final speaker of today, Fabian Radon, uh, Fabian is the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Acades Power. Uh, joining the company back in 2009, he is an expert when it comes to the opposed piston engine and has played a critical role in many of the technology development programs at Acades. So Fabian is going to share some of the latest results and developments from the heavy duty program in the last year and lay out what is planned for, for the future. So thank you, Fabian. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for, for the introduction. Thank you very much for CalSTART for organizing this event, for uh, their support and management of the program. Uh, they help in putting the team together. Certainly uh, great work there. Um, certainly also, you know, I want to thank myself, uh, you know, all the, the organize, organizations that supported us, CARB and the AQMDs in, the, uh, in California uh, to put this, this program together. So uh, I will be taking you through some uh, some technical aspects. First, I you know I will uh, I will introduce the technology at a fairly high level, and then talk more specifically about the the program that we're doing around around the uh, you know with the CARB support, and uh, and then I will go into some next steps that we're taking to uh, to push the ball even further than what we have been able to do uh, with this program. Next next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a, a little bit of a high-level overview of, of the technology. Uh, so you can see on the on the right side uh, the animation of uh, of uh, of an opposed piston engine. So this is a three-cylinder opposed piston engine, like the one we uh, we have deployed for this program. Uh, three-cylinder works very well for for an opposed piston engine, uh, fully balanced, and uh, and also provides some other advantages. So you can see uh, basically uh, the the function of the engine, the way it's laid out, is relatively simple. Uh, two pistons, one in, in, uh, in, uh, at either end, each end of the cylinder, one crankshaft at the top, one crankshaft at the bottom. These are basically the only parts that are moving in the engine. So fairly simple uh, construction and certainly made of, of very conventional material. So one of the, the first uh, fundamental advantage that we have with the opposed piston engine is that the cylinder geometry, because it's uh, composed of two pistons, uh, has a longer stroke than the conventional four-stroke engine, and therefore the geometry leads to lower heat losses. So the the opposed piston engine also uh, what uh, what makes uh, a unique characteristic is that the uh, control of the charge, the control of the uh, the air and the EGR, is all uh, entirely flexible and control externally. So that allows us to really set the uh, the conditions inside the cylinder to exactly what needs to be uh, uh, there. To achieve the efficiency and the and, and the emission controls that is necessary, the uh, combustion happens between two pistons. So you can imagine uh, when the two pistons are coming to each other, uh, this is uh, the shape. The resultant shape is what is forming our combustion system, and that provides a lot of flexibility to uh, to uh, provide a very efficient and very uh, clean combustion that allows us then to push the engine to its extremes without uh, without any uh, combustion uh, challenges. So, uh, you know, you will see through my presentation that basically we've been able to demonstrate with our, our first prototype AVDC engine, a 7% CO2 reduction compared to 2021 standards and a 96% uh, reduction in NOx compared to the current standards. So very significant accomplishments uh, from a first, you know, AVDC engine uh, opposed person prototype. So, so like I mentioned, this is uh, what you believe is a technology that will be uh, uh, easy to implement and, and, uh, and adopt in the industry. 
because it's uh, made of conventional materials, because in general, it has a, a much lower number of parts than the force shock engine. It has, uh, uh, it really can leverage the existing infrastructure for making engines. And in the end, uh, we end up with a, a product uh, that uh, achieves this uh, uh, CO2 and NOx reductions with a, a lower cost. Uh, and in big part, because we're able to achieve these ultra low NOx levels with a, a conventional underflow treatment system, as I will show you. Next slide. So uh, the way we, we achieve uh, this, uh, this balance of uh, NOx and CO2 reduction is by managing and uh, leveraging the flexibility of the engine. So what, uh, what I'm showing here is a, a little uh, example of one of the modes that, that we use. And uh, I want to make sure uh, that this is clear to everyone how we actually manage this uh, and uh, uh, how we leverage the flexibility of the engine because this is a key optimization parameter and, uh, and the way that we leverage the, the engine capability. So on one end, we can, we can achieve very high efficiency uh, by leveraging all the advantages I've mentioned. Uh, you can see here uh, at the upper uh, right corner, the brake thermal efficiency map of you know, recent uh, tests that we did with uh, efficiencies uh, uh, very close to 50% at 49, uh, higher than 49% brake thermal efficiency with a very flat fuel map, which is, uh, which is important uh, for real, real life uh, fuel economy and efficiency. And at the same time, we are able to manage exhaust gas temperatures in a range that is uh, very suitable for a continuous attachment system operation. So the key with the high efficiency mode is to preserve high conversion efficiency in the attachment system uh, so that, and achieve the very high efficiency. Uh, you will see that the, the other modes that we have allow us to actually manage emissions when the attachment system is not fully activated. So this is one of the um, uh, extreme end of the range of what we can do with air engine, that's the high efficiency mode. And then if you go on to the next slide, then there is what we call the catalyst light of mode. This catalyst light of mode is, uh, is, uh, delivers a capability uh, from our engine that uh, allows us to, uh, uh, in conjunction, manage extremely low engine out uh, and also very high exhaust gas temperatures. And this mode is basically what uh, we use uh, when the attachment system is not yet active to make sure that the top up emissions remains very low. And you'll see some examples of that in some transient results that we'll be sharing with you. But basically, if you see at the upper right corner, this is the engine out uh, NOx uh, in grams per kilowatt hour. And it's extremely low uh, at idle. We are already below the five grams per hour, uh, 0.5 five grams per hour uh, clean idle. So we would not even need an SCR activated uh, to manage that. And you can see in the, in the lower, lower center, the after treatment, the exhaust temperature uh, range, uh, you can see at very low loads, we are very close to 500 degrees Celsius. And this is obviously something we put in place uh, when the aftertreatment system is not active. And as soon as it's activated, we go to the high efficiency mode. And that's how we are able to balance NOx and CO2 very effectively at the same time. Go on to the next slide. So these are some of the, you know, some of the attributes that we use for our engine to manage those, uh, those different modes and, ex 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 and uh, utilize the flexibility that we have. So like I mentioned, the flexible charger system uh, with the, uh, an air system that is completely decoupled from the engine that allows us to change the boost pressure, the air mass flow, the EGR rates, not only internal EGR rates, but also external EGR rates with complete flexibility. And that really uh, allows us to preserve hot gases in the cylinder when we want it, when we want to increase the exhaust gas temperatures uh, while minimizing that at the same time. You can see in this, uh, in this uh, lower right chart, uh, we are uh, combining internal and external EGR to achieve what we need. In this case, for example, in some of the lower load operation, we are running upwards of 60% of EGR in total, which is something that uh, you know, cannot be easily achieved and also cannot necessarily be handled by the combustion system. And like I, like I mentioned with our combustion system from by the two pistons, we are able to handle very extreme conditions like this without uh, excessive soot, without ex excessive hydrocarbon emissions. Uh, while preserving very high combustion efficiency. And that, that's one of the enablers uh, for all of that. One of the reference points that we, uh, we looked at recently is actually at the same NOx level, uh, we noticed that our engine is operating at about 
a quarter of the knock, a quarter of the suit uh, compared to a fossil engine. So that's another illustration of the quality of our combustion system. Go to the next slide. Right, so after this little introduction of the technology itself, um, I want to go more specifically into the deliverables and the activities related to the program that uh, that we are uh, summarizing for you today. Uh, so li like the team has mentioned, uh, uh, funded in part by CARB, uh, led by CalStart, and also uh, with a lot, of, a lot of great support from several technology partners. Um, so uh, Bill mentioned a little bit of, of the, the members in the list here, but I want to elaborate a little bit on that. And so we are we are very uh, you know very thankful for for everyone's support. Uh, it's for providing uh, charging charging components, uh, Armco uh, testing services, who has been uh, supporting us uh, heavily uh, by providing after system controls, by providing uh, uh, test our capability, and certainly sharing all their expertise in in the in the engine development. Honeywell for providing the turbocharger, Delphi on the fuel system, uh, Southwest in supporting us with the uh, after treatment system, uh, uh, I would say selection and and uh, and leadership. <clears throat> Tineco with uh, some of the power center components, ExxonMobil with some additional support for CI with the after treatment system, uh, Canning BSF with the um, the substrate, uh, the uh, the wash coats and the uh, after treatment system analysis. Modine with the coolers and Corning with the after treatment substrates. So really a, a very uh, a very good team uh, with the specialty that really covered the, the range of of needs that we had for this program. So you can see the program goals uh, were to reduce NOx by 90% and to achieve CO2 levels that are uh, basically the 2024 CO2 levels at 437 grams per hour uh, for the DST cycle. And you will see that we're able to, to meet, uh, meet those targets. On to the next slide. So the engine that we developed and configured uh, for this, uh, this effort uh, is our fir first heavy duty uh, demonstrator, our first heavy duty opposed piston engine. And uh, this engine is a 10.6 liter in, in this place, oh, wow. three cylinder engine. Awesome. And uh, that basically <laughs> has the capability to replace a, uh, a four stroke 13 to 15 liter engine. This engine is, uh, is rated at uh, uh, about 400 horsepower in this in this for this project, but uh, the capability you know is is, uh, is higher than that. Just this is what we have used for this this program. If you go on to the next slide. So uh, as part of the the program, we are demonstrating uh, and actually uh, um, testing this this uh, this engine in a Peterbilt truck that will be used in a, in an actual fleet. Uh, over the summer. So right now we are uh, finishing the uh, the engine integration in the truck. Um, and uh, you can see a picture of it here. So the engine fits well. You know, this is the first post-up engine. There's certainly uh, a lot of opportunity for making it uh, lighter, smaller, better integrated, and so on and so forth. But the engine works well. The truck is driving, uh, you know, syn synchronized with the transmission. The after system is installed. And everything is running well, and we are getting ready for the fleet demonstration, uh, which will happen in uh, in Southern California, uh, in the month of from July until until September of this year. So, looking forward to that. We're going to the next slide. So, uh, when we started the program, one of the uh, the impetus for for really uh, uh, doing this uh, was the promise that we demonstrated from uh, a previous uh, prototype engine. That we're able to control exhaust gas temperatures and NOx uh, to a very uh, good level that would enable uh, achieving the ultra low NOx. So you can see we started off with the data from our previous engine, which is the which are the blue uh, curves on these plots on the left side. This is the exhaust gas temperatures uh, for the first 50 seconds of the cold FTP cycle, and uh, on the right side this is the the same cycle, but this is the cumulative NOx. So we're referencing a couple of other programs. Uh, one of them is, uh, is work that Southwest did for CARB in the early phases of the, the development, where they uh, basically documented what they could do with the four stroke engine. And you can see the red line is, is what they had at that time. Uh, so already we were showing some, some better capability. But what we found as we developed the engine and specifically with this uh, heavy duty engine, uh, we found that we can actually 
uh, achieve even higher exhaust gas temperatures and even lower NOx at the same time than what we expected at the beginning of the program. So, you know, the team has been able to leverage, uh, leverage the capability of the engine and push it even beyond uh, where, where we had been able to do before. And so that has, has opened up new opportunities uh, to, uh, to actually make the program even more meaningful and even more, um, even more accomplishments. So if you go on to the next slide, so this is where we talk about the afterpayment system that we selected at the beginning of the program uh, with the team. So this is, again, the afterpayment system team that, uh, that uh, we have collaborated with to, uh, to develop this, this program. And you can see we started with a system that was relatively complex. Uh, we knew it was going to be robust. We knew it was going to be able to meet the ultra Linux in conjunction with our engine. This was composed of a closed couple SCR with ammonia injection and an underfloor system, including an SCRF. What we found based on the results that I just shown you is that we actually uh, should be able to uh, accomplish and meet the ultra Linux without the closed couple system, just with the underfloor system. And so with after a number of uh, testing, um, you know, testing FTP cycle, a BSF, simulating the different configurations, we concluded that it was uh, it was good enough for us to uh, transition the program to this underfloor system only, which obviously simplifies the control, simplifies the integration in the vehicle, and uh, and certainly showcases you know the capability of of the system uh, even more. So if you go on, go on to the next slide. So this next slide shows uh, the results. Uh, so there's a lot, lot of technical results behind all of this. I've, I've uh, brought in uh, some of that here. Uh, tests that we did at Armco. So like I mentioned, uh, the test center in the, in the Detroit uh, area um, is where we tested our, our engine with the aptitude system coupled uh, to demonstrate this, uh, this uh, tailpipe emissions. So this is a cold FTP cycle. Uh, this is the first, this is actually the whole FTP cycle, 200 seconds, the whole uh, cold FTP cycle. And you can see some of the characteristics that I've described, right? With the engine out uh, temperature uh, in red here and uh, how that impacts the temperature of the afterburn system on the floor. Again, this is only in the underfloor system. So fairly simple, you know, relatively conventional afterburn system. Uh, you can see the temperature traces, you can see the urea dosing rates here. But more importantly, what you can see here in the lower part of the chart is the NOx characteristics, the, uh, the actual uh, dynamic uh, NOx concentration, both at the engine out in green and uh, the tailpipe in blue. And you can see uh, that uh, at the beginning of the cycle, uh, the engine out NOx is very low. And this is when the catalyst out of mode is activated. You can also uh, see that uh, very quickly, at about after about 250 seconds, basically there is no more tailpipe NOx coming out. Right, everything is is uh, is uh, converted by the SCR. So with the uh, very high exhaust gas temperature and exhaust energy that we're able to provide right after the cold start, and the very low NOx that we're able to produce at the same time, uh, we are able to achieve a 0 0.067 grams per horsepower tailpipe NOx. Over, over that first uh, first part of the cycle, the cold FTP cycle. So obviously the key uh, here is always to balance how much of the catalyst out of mode we use and how much of the high efficiency mode we use to optimize uh, and minimize fuel consumption and uh, still meet the, the NOx level. Uh, on the hot cycle, which is the next slide, if you can go to the next slide. So after a 20 minute soak, uh, then the hot uh, part of the FTP cycle is run. And it's obviously an, another very critical part of the cycle because this counts at six, six sevenths of the overall uh, emissions. And you can see here that we resume the test, the, the, the cycle with, uh, with fairly high exhaust gas temperature, very low engine out NOx uh, to man manage the treatment uh, system as it's uh, getting back, uh, back online. Uh, but you can see that the tailpipe NOx is very, very low. We are at 0 0.008 on this uh, uh, hot FTP cycle, which allows us to, uh, to achieve a 0 0.016 grams per hour on the combined FTP cycle, which meets our 0 0.02 uh, target that we have for the program. And again, this is a, a very important cycle, the hot FTP cycle, uh, to manage the balance between the catalyst set of operation and the high efficiency operation because that's uh, very, uh, very critical for, for CO2 emissions. You can see that we're able to achieve 97.5% uh, conversion efficiency of the call on the cold FTP cycle and 99.7 on the hot, uh, which for an underfloor system only 
is really exceptional. And again, that's enabled by the, uh, the temperature and NOx control of our engine. You can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we uh, we noticed as we uh, as we developed the engine, as we as we developed and integrated uh, the engine with the assessment system, is that there are, there are some additional benefits beyond the uh, great flexibility that that our engine provides uh, to extract the most efficiency out of the SCR, and uh, that's that's in the way the uh, temperature and the ammonia storage are are, are balanced. And uh, basically, the higher ammonia is stored on the SCR, the higher efficiency uh, the SCR can, can achieve. Um, but if there's too much ammonia stored, then there's ammonia slip that can happen. And that especially happens when temperatures uh, go above a certain threshold. And you can see in the, in the plot on the upper right, uh, where I'm showing uh, basically the temperature range of the opposed piston engine and the additional uh, temperature range that typical four stroke engine uh, have to operate within to achieve the full capability. And that uh, this temperature above 300 degrees Celsius is a temperature where uh, ammonia storage is a lot more difficult. And because with our engine, we have a very narrow temperature range and typically a maximum SCR temperature of about 300 degrees, that allows us to be more aggressive uh, with uh, ammonia stored which allows us to achieve continuously and, uh, and under a more, more uh, a broader range of conditions, a very high SCR conversion efficiency, and also allows us to set up the SCR in a way that when the call, next call start happens, it will be uh, activated very quickly and achieve very high efficiency very quickly. And that allows us to, uh, to better balance the amount of uh, operation that we do in the catalyst light of mode and allows us to run uh, more efficiently. So this is an additional, I would say, detail that uh, expands beyond the, the base capability that I've described, uh, you know, as we look into integration and, and interactions uh, with the different systems. Go on to the next slide. So uh, what I've just presented was uh, basically what we have done as part of the, of the CAR program and uh, basically the uh, emission uh, results that I've shown is what we have implemented in the truck that will be running the truck. Uh, but we have also uh, continued to advance the state of the development of the engine. So uh, what we call version two uh, is uh, the next generation hardware of our, of our VGT engine. Uh, it's basically the same engine. We're just changing some components. Uh, more specifically, we are um, improving the air system. And, uh, and also making some pre-trim improvements. So on the air system side, uh, what we have done is we have transitioned from a turbocharger and supercharger or charge pump combination to a single stage uh, turbocharger. And what we have selected for this work is to work with super turbo. So super turbo uh, provides a driven, mechanically driven uh, turbocharger, which allows uh, uh, to access much higher uh, compressor and turbine efficiencies because of the I would say the lack of uh, turbo speed uh, dependency and, and reliance. And that provides uh, great advantages for our engine, especially uh, because of uh, being a flow device, uh, it's very sensitive to the pressure differential between the intake and the exhaust. And that really allows us to, uh, to extract uh, the highest uh, engine efficiency. Uh, certainly another critical aspect of the super turbo is the ability to control the turbo speed because it's mechanically coupled to the engine. And that provides a lot of flexibility to um, to increase the, the boost pressure uh, independently of, of the engine speed and the, the, the turbine conditions. Uh, and I think importantly, what uh, this uh, super turbo uh, enables us to do is to, to switch to a single stage uh, boosting system. The benefit of single stage is not only uh, that it's much simpler, it requires only a single uh, charger cooler, but also uh, that all the air that is drawn into the air system is coming from ambient instead of having a, uh, a secondary um, air system or air stage that uh, starts with a higher temperature. So that, that also further improves the efficiency of the air system and really allows us to, uh, to minimize the pumping, the pumping work. There are conditions where basically uh, our engine does not require any mechanical assistance to pump, pump the air. Um, and also that system preserves our, our full capability for catalyst level of calibration, which is obviously a critical capability that we want to make sure that we can preserve. Uh, we also uh, coupled this uh, super turbo with an EGR pump uh, that uh, Ethan provided to us, and that provides a full independent uh, cold external EGR, which is uh, a critical aspect, obviously, of the, of the control system. 
And on the friction side, uh, we switched to Duraglide uh, compression rings from Teneco with a lower face width and, and also a, therefore a lower uh, friction coating. Uh, we also switched to an APS spray bore from Orlicon Medco and went down to a lower um, uh, oil viscosity, which is uh, obviously uh, beneficial to lower friction, lower oil pumping uh, as well. But that's, uh, that's uh, I would say, a, uh, a, a viscosity that our engine uh, can more readily accept than fossil engines because of the uh, lack of uh, valve trains and, uh, and their, their, their sensitivity to that. So this is what I've been talking, I would be talking about now, uh, some of the results from this uh, version two engine. So if you go on to the next slide. So in conjunction with uh, the base engine improvements, uh, what we also looked at, in, uh, we looked at into, I would say, simplifying the equipment system, switching from an SCRF to conventional DOCDPF system. And that, uh, that uh, analysis was done by BASF, where we provided engine out uh, measured uh, data and then uh, fed that into the BASF uh, attachment system analysis tool. And uh, the conjunction of the, uh, the new engine uh, characteristics and this attachment system configuration enabled us to push, to push the limit even further. One of the advantage of this system is that it uh, provides a better thermal insulation during the, especially during the, uh, um, the soak between the cold and the hot FTP cycle, which allows us to have higher temperatures when we start again on the hot FTP cycle. And that has allowed us to, uh, to show capability to achieve even lower uh, knocks on the FTP cycle. So we're expecting 0 0.007, so uh, quite a bit lower lower than the 0.01 and uh, much lower than the 0.02 uh, limitation and still be able to, uh, to, meet, uh, to meet the SCT cycle requirement as well. So, you know, when we're working with, uh, with companies like, like BSF, for example, with a lot of experience, you know, developing attachment systems for a variety of applications, it's, it's great to hear, you know, their feedback in terms of uh, how the capabilities and the flexibility that the post system engine provides and how we can find the synergy and optimization of the system to leverage uh, to leverage that to achieve the ultra low max and the CO2 uh, performance. We go on to the next slide. We we'll have some more details of the um, of the results that uh, that uh, Dave Youngren at BSF uh, ran for us. And basically, what we're seeing is that with this uh, this system uh, that I've just shown with the conventional DOC DPF instead of an SCRF. We're basically able to achieve a very similar conversion efficiency than what we've measured with our, uh, our CARB program. But uh, you can see that on the HUT, we're able to achieve even higher conversion efficiency, which is obviously critical uh, to, uh, to reducing the emissions even further. So we expect 99.9% .9 conversion over the, the HUT FTP cycle with the system which is described. And that's in combination with the, the ability to reduce the amount of time we spend in CLO because in catalyst slide of mode because this attachment system has a great insulation allows us to uh, improve the CO2. So uh, this combination on the FTP cycle uh, will get uh, 0.07 grams per horsepower NOx and at the same time 465 grams per horsepower CO2. The, uh, the regulation uh, for 2027 for vocational applications on the FTP cycle is 503 grams per horsepower CO2. So we are again there with a lot of margin on CO2, even on the FTP cycle, while still meeting ultra low NOx with a, a simple underfloor attachment system. So lots, lots of potential here that we're seeing uh, you know, for with this uh, version two engine to manage uh, CO2 even further and, and NOx as well. You want to the next slide? So this is a bit of a summary of the work that we have done with uh, what we call the version one, which is uh, what we've done uh, and deployed for the CARB demonstration, as well as the version two, which is the version we just uh, talked about. So you can see we, uh, for the version one with the CARB demo, we have, we have met our, our goals for the program. For the version two, we have pushed that a quite a bit further. You can see now on the SET cycle, we're at 415 grams per horsepower, which is uh, much below the 2027, um, uh, APA regulation of 432. So it provides a significant margin to even 2027 regulation. And you can see that on the NOx level, we still have a very significant margin. This is actually a, a very significant margin uh, from the 0.02 uh, with the potential to, uh, to therefore meet even lower uh, regulation uh, levels. 
and 465 grams of horsepower CO2 on the uh, FTP cycle, uh, which is much lower the to, to the, from the 503 for vocational trucks. We are able to, um, to also, like I mentioned, uh, control NOx very well at very low loads. Uh, so that allows us to meet the clean idle, even without the SCR being activated, just engine out, we're able to control NOx below the five grams per hour. The low, low load cycle is something we're still working on. Uh, but uh, all the signs look very good. Obviously, this capability I described is extremely applicable and uh, very effective on the load cycle as well. Go on to the next slide. So uh, another another way to illustrate uh, uh, you know the capability of our engine is to compare that to some data that uh, was published in March uh, on the in the MTZ magazine, which is a German uh, technical. Uh, magazine uh, where AVL published a study that they did um, using a 12.7 liter uh, phosphor engine uh, and uh, also demonstrated the ultra Linux capability with uh, with a very different approach and different system than, than what we uh, we just uh, uh, showed you. If you can go on to the next slide. So this is the uh, configuration uh, of obviously our, our engine uh, that I've described to you, uh, the one uh, the system that we tested uh, with the SCRF uh, is the data we're going to use to compare to the data that AVR published um, using a conventional engine. Uh, but what they what they had to do uh, is uh, add a, a significant amount of, of uh, equipment on the attachment system side. So they started with the, an electric heater that is mounted just after the turbocharger, the closed couple SCR, uh, and uh, and the uh, sleep catalyst with uh, its own uh, urea injector. Uh, then they have uh, a conventional underfloor system, basically with a secondary DF injector. Uh, when you have a closed couple SCR, you also need to add an external hydrocarbon injector to manage the DPF regeneration. And so uh, they were able they were they were able to achieve the point or two with the system. Uh, and I'll show you uh, how that compares uh, with the performance of our engine. If you go to the next slide. Yeah, so this this is this chart these charts compare the performance that we measured on our uh, FDGT post piston engine as part of the CARP program to the data that uh, AVL shared in uh, in this uh, in this paper. So you can see in terms of the engine out uh, temperature, which is the upper left uh, chart, uh, we are obviously uh, again uh, increasing the temperature very quickly after after the start. This is the first first 500 seconds of the FTP cycle. And we are sustainable, sustainably uh, higher in temperature for the first three or 400 seconds. Um, you can see at the same time in the lower left corner, uh, we have the engine out NOx. So like I've mentioned, we're able to control NOx to a very low level while managing very high PCS temperatures. So similar scenario to what we have seen before. But what's interesting, right, is that uh, the benchmark engine, the four stroke engine, is actually uh, using a close couple SCR plus uh, electric heater, whereas we're only using the underfloor system. And we're still able to uh, heat up the system very quickly. So you can see the, in the upper right corner, the uh, light blue is the temperature of the close couple SCR for the four stroke engine, and the gray is the SCR for our underfloor system. And you can see that we are we're not trailing very far, even though the engine is the the treatment system is on the floor much further down downstream. And uh, and even with uh, this slightly lower temperature, uh, because we have a lower engine out NOx, we're able to manage the tailpipe NOx, which is a lower right corner uh, chart. And you can see that the opposed piston engine with that much simpler treatment system is able to achieve much lower tailpipe NOx. So by 500 seconds, the opposed piston engine has basically generated half of the tailpipe NOx than the four stroke engine benchmark. And this is with without all this additional complexity, without an, uh, an electric heater, without a close couple SCR, and so on and so forth. And in the end, when we look at the combined data of the whole FTP cycle, uh, which we, we measured 0 0.016 and uh, the four stroke engine benchmark is at 0 0.018. So, uh, all of that, and we're still uh, able to achieve even lower NOx levels. So a very another way to illustrate uh, the capability of our engine. If you go on to the next slide. So obviously one critical aspect uh, is, is the NOx and CO2. And, uh, and so talking about CO2, uh, 
um, in the paper, they did not uh, specify exactly what CO2 level uh, the force shock engine was able to achieve, but uh, they mentioned that certainly to drive the electrical heater that is installed after uh, after the engine, uh, there is uh, uh, an electrical power consumption that needs to be uh, replenished uh, from the engine that creates about a 1% increase in fuel consumption. Uh, whereas on, on our side, obviously, we, are, we have talked about the CO2 capabilities that, that we have shown uh, you know, with a, a very significant reduction in CO2 even compared to uh, 2027 standards. We're going to go on to the next slide. So in the end, when we look at, uh, at the whole equation, right, uh, like, like General was saying, it's not just about uh, NOx or just about CO2, it's about both in conjunction and very importantly, uh, you know, what it does in real life. But also in order to, uh, to be able to access this level of performance, uh, what's very important is also the cost, right? And the cost is, is in relationship with the complexity, uh, uh, with the amount of technology that is deployed not only because it increases the, the more technology, the more complexity, it increases the, the cost of the, the, the product at the beginning, but it also increases warranty costs, right? Uh, reliability is directly proportional to the amount of, of parts, the amount of uh, technology and components that are, are being used. And certainly by avoiding uh, any uh, electrical heaters, any uh, complex mechanisms to, uh, that the force engine needs, that uh, gives us a much more stable, much more simple and robust uh, system to meet the future regulation. So we can see from uh, from analysis and studies that we have done uh, based on published data that we expect that the post system engine base cost will be about ten thousand dollar less at the 2027 emission level compared to the solutions that the fossil engine will need to deploy to achieve that that uh, performance. So in the end, what we see uh, is the opportunity to reduce CO2, reduce NOx, and cost at the same time. And uh, if you go on to the next slide, so as a conclusion, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, that I think is really critical here is that uh, making uh, an efficient and clean technology affordable will guarantee its its um, its usage and its uh, um, adoption uh, much more aggressively. And, uh, and I think that's one of the one of the key aspects that that we that we want to really emphasize is. Uh, how fast can the industry uh, adopt a technology like this if it's in fact the same cost or less expensive than what is currently in place today? So I think we believe the opposed piston engine with its, uh, its uh, simultaneous reduction in CO2 and NOx capability while keeping the NOx, uh, the, the cost under check, uh, will be a great transition technology to, um, you know, to meet the future goals uh, for the environment. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to Thank you, everyone, and uh, certainly we'll be open for questions. Thank you, Kevin. Great. Thank you, Fabian. And again, thank you to CARB and all of our project partners that contributed to these impressive and, and promising results so far. Um, we, we do truly have a world-class team of partners supporting the development of this heavy-duty uh, post-piston engine. So, so that concludes the presentation segment of this demonstration review. Um, we now have time for our speakers to answer any questions that uh, you may have. So if you do have a question and you haven't yet submitted it, please remember to use the Q&A box in the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, and actually, Fabian, I'm going to put you right back in the hot seat and, and tee up a question that came from David M. Johnson from Westport Fuels. He asked, uh, can low carbon fuels like natural gas, biomethane, and or hydrogen be used in the Acades power engine to reduce further uh, the emissions impact of heavy duty trucking while maintaining or improving the economic advantages of the OP engine technology. Great, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, so the, the answer is, is yes, absolutely. Um, so the post piston engine um, has a lot of flexibility to manage the charge conditions, uh, like I've explained. There's also a lot of real estate around the combustion system to um, you know, to manage any any uh, injectors that may be necessary for, for gaseous fuels. But also, I think when you think about uh, hydrogen, for example, one important characteristic that the engine has inherently, you know, even as we develop it for diesel, is that uh, the engine uh, is operated under linear conditions and burning hydrogen in lean conditions lead to uh, almost zero NOx. And so when you're burning hydrogen, you don't have hydrocarbon, you don't have CO, you don't have CO2. And we believe with the opposed piston engine, we have the ability to also uh, not have 
any NOx coming out. So you can imagine an engine uh, burning hydrogen basically without any after treatment system requirement and without any actual emissions coming out of the tailpipe. Another interesting aspect of, of uh, an internal combustion engine burning hydrogen is that it does not require a very high purity hydrogen, which uh, opens up the door for low cost hydrogen and, uh, and different sources of hydrogen as well. Great, great. Thanks, Fabian. Um, so another question that's been coming through the chat is, you know, it's great that this demonstration program that CARB funded and CalSTART led and Katie's Power developed here, the core technology for the demonstration, but how long before the solution is available commercially and what can be done to speed that timeline up? I'll go ahead and open it up to anyone who wants to chime in on this one. John Wall, you want to take a shot at that? Uh, I think uh, give us a sense of where this goes next. Sure, I think so. The, you know, this is the technology development that is fundamental to building uh, an engine product. And as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, putting together a group of partners um, to move ahead with this, to develop it uh, for commercialization. So for where we sit right now and what's been demonstrated to date, I think it's really quite feasible to be ready for the 2027 timeframe uh, to meet those regulations and possibly even uh, a bit uh, before that, but certainly in that time frame. Great. Any other thoughts on that from our speakers? I get the sense, and Fabian, maybe you'd like to weigh in on this, that one of the things we'd really like to do, and John really pointed this out, that we want to pull together a coalition or consortium of companies and some engine makers uh, but we need to move it into a rapid piloting stage, move from the demo stage to pilot. Fabian, you want to just describe a little bit what you envision we need to be doing to get to 2024 and then 2027? Yes, absolutely. So uh, certainly the, uh, the stake in the ground that we've been able to do uh, you know, through the, the work we've, we've just uh, reviewed uh, really shows and path, uh, clear, a clear path to what needs to be done to, uh, to launch this engine production. And uh, I think at this point, we, we have a, a strategic uh, uh, partner that is ready to fund, fund the development, a professional development, but uh, there is a, a big team that needs to be put in place. And right now we are, we are assembling a team of partners to, uh, to support and uh, develop the engine with us and to prepare it for production. Uh, so like, like John mentioned, uh, certainly uh, we, we welcome uh, you know, participation and, and support uh, uh, to join the team and uh, bring this engine to production. Yeah, I just to add back, you know, reflecting back on the S curves, uh, you know, this, we believe this could be another one of those cusps as Fabian has shown the capability of the engine, the ability to have lower cost and more robust uh, after treatment uh, to be able to meet these standards going forward. And Bill, as you pointed out, uh, we've got a lot of incentives and uh, directives to move to electrification in many places, which I'm personally optimistic about. However, there are gonna be some applications like commercial class eight line haul and off-road applications that are gonna be more difficult. And so we think this is a technology that's certainly able to work across all those applications and do it in a way that's much more cost-effective than all the add-ons that will have to go with four stroke engine to make that engine comply with the 2027 regulations. Great, so um, I'm going to tee this next question up for, for Bill Robertson. So California is requiring that truck manufacturers develop and sell an increasing percentage of zero emission vehicle trucks. On a parallel path, CARB is requiring combustion engine vehicles to attain low NOx levels. And you touched a little bit on this in your presentation, but if you can elaborate, how does CARB view and balance the investments that need to happen in these two very different though complementary technology pathways? Well, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we have very clear commitments to the zero emission pathway and, and, and you know, decarbonizing our entire economy. Um, but we see that that's an important thing. I mean, Bill was talking about the climate emergency and we, we take that very seriously. Um, but we, we do see a lot of these uh, technologies as being evolutionary uh, in, in how the some of these after treatment technologies are applied and whatnot. So um, we really do think that the, it's necessary to continue 
uh, cleaning up the, the combustion technologies as we, we move forward. Um, we're, we're talking about you know, quite a number of years of transition here. And so um, we're, we're, we're definitely prioritizing uh, cleaning up the combustion along the way. Great, thanks, Bill. And, and Bill Van Amberg, any, any additional thoughts on, on that question? I think there's some uh, pragmatic issues that we obviously have to deal with. I think as we go forward, we just can't afford as a society to put dollars into things that can't get us down this dual path. So I think as, as we're increasingly we're looking forward, if, if it can't be full zero emissions, you know, on that combustion side, it's got to show, as, as I think this engine does, that's why we've been so supportive of it, that it can make the movement towards low criteria emissions and carbon at the same time. But I think, you know, when you really get down to it, I think the dollars from public agencies are going to be focused on things that are deeply decarbonized fuels and highly efficient, high or very low emission engines uh, on the combustion side. And there's just not enough public dollars to mess with anything else. Great. Thank you. So um, Robert Parsons asked in the chat here, Emphasis for demonstrating uh, and piloting is on freight vehicles, which, which uh, is obvious. Any considerations regarding transit bus applications? Yeah, I can mention a couple of things about that. I mean, uh, certainly the transit bus uh, applications uh, have different requirements than the, the long haul uh, freight. Um, you know, I think the, it seems there seems to be a, a good momentum for transit buses to uh, to electrify, but certainly the autonomous engine uh, could be a very good application for that. You know, if if that's uh, if that's necessary, uh, one key key aspect of transit buses is the stop and go up operation, which uh, can be very challenging for the attachment system. And some of the same capabilities that I've shown uh, can be leveraged for these applications as well to keep everything uh, very clean. I'll tell you one of the things I'm excited about for this engine, and obviously this the over the road application is kind of the big target point uh, and, a, and a really tough one for electrification. I, I, not impossible, but, but tougher. But I would say uh, off-road, I'm really excited about the use of this kind of engine architecture in off-road and being able to get to ultra low emissions, particularly in construction and other equipment that are just gonna be really hard uh, for infrastructure and other reasons to fully electrify. Uh, I also think this engine would be an ideal engine for a, uh, a hybridization scheme, uh, operating in its clean spot, incredibly efficient and low emitting, and then adding a additional power or as a power generator in a hybrid scheme, I think it could also be a powerful tool. So I, I do see this architecture is really powerful in a number of different uh, venues. Yeah, I think off-road is, is an interesting application range as well. Uh, it's clear that uh, you know off-road applications are, are challenged with uh, with heat rejection in a lot of cases, and certainly the source of our higher efficiency comes from the lower heat losses, right? So lower coolant losses, lower coolant uh, loads, um, and also the ability to manage uh, engine out emissions uh, while preserving uh, low heat rejection, I think, is a critical enabler to uh, off-road applications as well. All right, Michael, Michael Dove is asking, the future of fuel costs of D2 will make B100 viable. The engine is perfect for using B100. B100 is no hard hydrocarbons that offers 50 to 60% reduction already today. Warranty engines running B100 is really far behind and no commitment there. Have you ran this engine with B100 or any studies with B100? We're certainly running our engine on, on biofuels is something that, uh, that is entirely uh, possible, capable. I would say the engine uh, flexibility enables us to, uh, to adapt to different fuels as necessary. And we see, we see that as a, as a good opportunity to, uh, to decarbonize, you know, I would say uh, a platform li like, like ours without significant uh, changes. Great, so um, again, if you have any questions and, and want them answered live, uh, please use that that Q and A box. Um, so, so question for me, and, and this can be uh, back to you, Fabian. So, again, conventional wisdom is that um, to get more NOx reductions from an engine, you do inevitably need to trade efficiency to do it. So, uh, you talked about this, but the post piston engine seems to change that equation, or at least reset the starting point. So, what are the main reasons why 
It can maintain efficiency while also reducing NOx. Right. Um, so so I, I've talked talk about it to some extent in my presentation. Um, I think first it starts with the flexibility to achieve ultra low NOx engine out and high exhaust gas temperatures to get the FCR lit up as soon as possible, but also to achieve very high efficiency when, when, the, when the SCR is activated. And, uh, and I think uh, you know, it comes from bo both, both parts and the flexibility to switch and minimize the amount of uh, operation in the catalyst out of mode as much as possible with uh, you know, smart attachment system integration, like, uh, like the example I've shared here. But uh, certainly you cannot achieve that if you don't have a very high, high efficiency engine to start with. And what, one thing I wanted to point out in terms of efficiency uh, we are we are still operating at a compression ratio of about 18 to 1, which is basically very similar to conventional engines today. Uh, there's still a lot of opportunity to you know to continue uh, developing the engine, increasing compression ratio, to exploit and explore even higher efficiencies. Yeah, if I can just parachute in, I, this is one of the things that's not immediately intuitive for people that have been doing four-stroke engine development uh, over time. And it's back to the business of this being a flow device. And so having the flexibility to be able to control the airflow through the engine uh, and thereby control the exhaust temperature to be able to elevate it at uh, light loads, to be able to control it uh, at peak loads is a very unique capability of the post-piston two-stroke engine. And so that optimization is what lets you break this connection between NOx, tailpipe NOx, uh, between NOx and uh, efficiency and deliver the AND of low NOx and um, good efficiency. Great. Um, so we have uh, time for maybe another question or two. Uh, Mario Sanchez asks, traditional four cycle diesel engine uh, brakes have been beneficial in heavy duty trucks. Would this engine offer similar capability or would or would it need to be coupled with a retarder? Also, would given RPM range and performance curves, would conventional transmission be compatible? Well, that's, that's an excellent question, and certainly, uh, certainly something that that we have uh, we have thought about as, as as we have you know done work with Peterbilt to integrate our engine in their truck. So currently, we are coupling uh, the uh, the engine with the uh, Ethan Cummins uh, twelve speed transmission basically the one that came out of the, uh, the four-stroke engine donor. So the speed range of the engine, the torque response of the engine is, uh, is basically mimicking what the four-stroke engines uh, are doing today. So no, no issues there. I would say, uh, you know, as we, as we look at the, uh, the characteristics of our engine, we see that uh, the, uh, the efficiency map that I've shown earlier is actually uh, less peaky and a lot flatter and broader than four-stroke engines. So we can even see the opportunity to, uh, to maybe simplify the transmission by not, uh, not having to uh, systematically run at the very specific operating condition in the engine map to extract the highest efficiency. So we can even imagine uh, you know, less number of uh, gear ratios in transmissions uh, when we optimize the system for cost and efficiency and so on in the future. In terms of engine brake, um, we actually have, have developed an engine brake for the opposed piston engine. Uh, this is a, a relatively simple system. It's a, a simple uh, valve, a small valve that we open at, uh, between the two pistons. And that basically continues to, uh, provides a continuous uh, leakage uh, of the, the C under pressure during braking. And that in combination with the, uh, the air system that we can manipulate to increase the boost pressure, increase the, the load on the system, uh, is able to achieve uh, engine braking that are uh, equivalent to what uh, you know decompression brakes are, are, are achieving on four stroke engines, and, and all of that with with a very simple system. It's basically a two stage, you know, meaning that there's there's compression loss in the cylinder, there's compression loss in the air system, and a two stroke braking cycle, right? Like 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 our combustion cycle. So very 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 great capability and a very simple system to accomplish uh, engine braking. Yeah, and again, to add the point, it all works without the pop, pop, pop that you get with the compression release from, uh, from a jake brake on a conventional engine. So in areas where there are noise regulations that prevent the use of current compression brakes, this one would actually work fine. You know, it's so interesting. I, I saw that question come up, and I've never heard that question asked of the opposed piston engine, so that was kind of delightful to see that.
All right, well, we are in the final minutes uh, here. So uh, I just want to thank our speakers, Bill Van Amberg, Bill Robertson, uh, Dr. John Wall and Fabian Radon. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today to learn more about this program and the great work that our, our team of project partners are doing. Um, this, this program is being recorded. So if you want to play back any of the presentations that you heard today, we will be sending out a link for you to access it after this. Uh, we also encourage you to share it with any of your colleagues who are interested in learning more about the program. So um, if you have additional questions or are interested in, in, in diving deeper, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or any of our speakers here. Uh, my email will be included in a follow-up that we will send out tomorrow. So again, thank you everyone for joining and I hope you all have a wonderful day.